Hello, my name is John Frankie. I'm the theologian in residence at Second Presbyterian Church, and this is study number three in our series, Exploring the Meaning of Pentecost, Pluralism, Unity, and Christian Faith. Now, remember in the first episode, we looked at the great diversity and plurality of the Christian church and suggested that that was one of the historical meanings of Pentecost. And in our second study, uh, we talked about the ways in which uh, that pluralism that's so much a part of the Christian faith extends even beyond just the Christian faith to include uh, the world. Uh, and we looked at the text uh, from the announcement of Jesus' birth in Luke's gospel and focused in on that idea that uh, the coming of Jesus would be good news for all people. And we sort of expanded this notion of pluralism um, to extend beyond just the Christian community. What we're going to do now and for the next couple of weeks is start to unpack a sort of fuller theology of Christian pluralism as we continue to explore the meaning of Pentecost. I'm not going to read the Pentecost text again, just in the interest of time, but remember uh, everyone's hearing the, the wonders of God or the wisdom, the speaking about God's deeds of power in their own language. And people were gathered from all over the known world. And in the summation of this event, it, we're told in Acts that all of them were amazed and perplexed, and they said to one another, what does this mean? And that's what we've been exploring in our series. Today, we want to focus in on that idea, but also this text from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Uh, this is the chapter where Paul talks about the ways in which the church is like a body. But leading into that, he says this, and starting in verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So here's this idea of different kinds of working through the Spirit, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So think about that. Uh, what we talked with what we talked about in the first week with the incredible pluralism and diversity of the Christian church uh, and all of the differences. We're going to talk more about that later. But what how can we understand this idea that it's the same spirit at work? That it's the same spirit at work in the phenomena of that first Pentecost. And then as all the folks went back to their homes and places where they lived from that event and told about it and shared about it, new churches were formed, new communities. So what's the theological basis, or if you will, the rationale for this idea? And this is part of the meaning of Pentecost and moves us in the direction of Christian pluralism. What we're going to do today briefly, and all of this will be brief, is we're going to start unpacking a theology of Christian pluralism. Uh, what does that look like? And today we're going to focus on two elements of that, uh, the life of God in Trinity and the idea that God speaks, which is known as revelation. And then next week, uh, we're going to talk about the witness to revelation, that scripture, and a bit more about the church before we uh, wrap up with the importance of unity in the midst of all this. But what about the Trinity? Let's start there. If we're saying that um, in our thesis that the pluralism or the plurality of the Christian church is a good thing, it's something that God intended, it's not a problem to be overcome, uh, how do we work at that theologically? And I'd like to suggest that we start by thinking about the classic Christian understanding of the life of God in Trinity, that the Trinity becomes our starting place for this idea. And so the Trinity is mysterious to lots of folks, uh, but it's based on the witness of Scripture. 
and became a, a succinct way of identifying the Christian conception of God. And this confession of Trinity emerged out of the attempt to address central theological questions for Christian faith, particularly this one, and this was a big one, and that is the relationship of Jesus Christ to the core Christian belief in one God. Uh, so Christians followed the Jewish tradition, saying that there is only one God, in contrast to the Roman pantheon and other uh, understandings of God that viewed the idea that there were many gods. Christians said, like the Jewish tradition, there's only one God. But because Christians worship Jesus, they concluded that Jesus is divine, but not the same as the Father. And this was a central affirmation, and it led to numerous approaches and variations in attempting to explain the ways in which the Father and the Son, and then later the Spirit, but focusing on the Father and Son, the ways in which they were both one and yet also distinct. So one and many. Um, there were two major errors that it was thought we needed to avoid. One was modalism. That was an overemphasis on the oneness or the unity of the Godhead. So modalism said something like this, look, there's only one God. But when that one God does certain things, we call that God Father. When that God does other things, we call that God Jesus. And when that God does other things, we call that God Spirit. But it's really, there really is only one and there's complete sameness. So that was, that was wiping away the distinction between Jesus and the Father. Tritheism, on the other hand, was an overemphasis on the differences. That said, yeah, there's Father, Son, and Spirit, and they are all God, but it so emphasized their distinctiveness that they weren't really one anymore. And so the concern here was that you'd end up with three gods, not just one. And of course, the spirit is also part of this because the Christian church understood the spirit as divine and yet not the same as the father or the son. Now we won't go through the long history, the permutations, the debates and discussions of the doctrine of the Trinity, but in the contemporary context, starting in the 20th century, this idea of the relational trinity or the social trinity came to the fore and it argued that yes there are fa there is father son and holy spirit who are different from each other but that they're they are one by virtue of their interdependent relationality that is they are so dependent on each other in their relationship that they are one even though they're also different so the idea here would be some of the ways in which uh, the New Testament, for instance, uh, and, the old, and the Hebrew Bible as well, could talk about a husband and a wife, a man and a woman being married and becoming one flesh, one, uh, one relational uh, uh, entity. Um, so similarly, God is viewed in that way. And here... Uh, difference and otherness are part of the divine life. While Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, their unity in this model is not the outgrowth of sameness. That is, they're not one because they're the same. They're different. And this means that plurality is part of God's life. So if we think about this with our basic uh, idea of a theology of Christian pluralism, it starts with God who exists eternally in three persons who are one or united, unified in solidarity by virtue of their interdependent relationality, but they still have difference. And so the very life of God is characterized by plurality and pluralism. Now, the second move, the second development that we want to talk about in, then is this idea of the doctrine of revelation or the classic way of talking about this is that God speaks. This is wrestling with the question 
on what basis are we able to justify or even believe our convictions about God other than simply affirming what we want and or hope to be true? That is, is our belief just what we want? And the Christian response to this idea is that no, it's not just what we want to be true, it's that God speaks. And revelation is the idea in which God speaks to us and makes God's self known to us. Now, it's not a, quite as simple as it sounds because the starting point for this, at least in our Reformed and Presbyterian tradition, is what we might call the creature create the creator creature distinction the difference between god and us it's one of the most basic assertions of the bible that god and human beings are not the same simply stated god is god and we are not and that means there's a difference in how god views the world and how we view the world this is all over scripture a couple of famous instances isaiah 55:8 says that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, that God's ways are not our ways. They're different. Second Peter 3, 8 in the New Testament says, for God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. That is, God is very different uh, from us. Now, that might seem obvious, but how do we keep that view uh, in play as we start to think about revelation. And what the Reformed tradition has said, along with others, is that what this means is that the infinite God is radically different from finite creatures. Uh, we are in time, but God is infinite. And this is the infinite qualitative distinction. There's a mouthful for you the infinite qualitative distinction between God and humans. And that means that human beings cannot comprehend ultimate divine truth. We get this from John Calvin, who said very simply, human beings cannot know the truth as God knows that truth to be. Why is that? Because human beings are finite and God is viewing things from an infinite perspective. Uh, it's hard for us to even imagine what that is about. We can talk about it, but we can't really experience it because our only context is finitude, the limitations of our being. So Calvin says, we can't know the truth. However, because God wants to have a relationship with us, God doesn't just leave the situation like that. What Calvin says is that God can condescends to our level. God knows that we have limitations on our understanding. And so God makes what Calvin refers to as baby talk or lisping. God lisps to us so that we can understand how God wants us to live. And this is the idea behind revelation, um, that God wants to build a relationship with us and so makes this baby talk to us so that we can understand how we ought to live. The purpose of revelation then is to draw creatures into relationship with their creator and to invite them to share in the love and fellowship of God and to participate in the divine mission, God's work of love and reconciliation. That means that revelation involves both a divine dimension and a human one. It's divine uh, because in God making God's self known to us in Jesus Christ, there is an objective element to it. That is, uh, there are some things that are true because that's simply the way they are. And it doesn't matter whether anybody believes it or not. So if God is God and if God is known in Jesus Christ, if that is true, as Christians assert, that is true whether anybody believes it or not. Hence, it is objective. But there's also a human element of revelation. That is the reception of revelation by humans who hear it and respond to it in our own very different contexts and settings. And this points to its subjective character, the ways in which um, 
God's done something objective, but it's viewed in different ways from different human perspectives. And this points to its subjective character and its plurality, right? So that, for instance, we'll talk about this next week in scripture, we see all the different ways in which human beings have responded to God's revelation. And so the conclusion here is that in thinking about this Christian pluralism, uh, we have plurality or pluralism in the very life of God. And we would expect, if that's true, that revelation itself, that God's speaking, would also be characterized by plurality. And we find that it is when we understand that it includes both what God has done and the human reception of that. So we have plurality in the life of God and in revelation. And this helps us to understand God's actions in Pentecost when we ask the question, what does this mean? And we see that there are, in fact, different kinds of working, but it's the same God who works in all. So if we think of the diversity of the church, we have different kinds of working in the spirit, but it's the same God at work in all. I know this is a bit ambitious. I hope that you have uh, that you're tracking along with me. You can uh, check out the notes. You can uh, re uh, watch the videos again. Uh, I have also written a book on this that was published uh, a number of years ago called Manifold Witness: The Plurality of Truth. You can check that out as well. And we've got two more sessions to go as we continue to grapple with the meaning of Pentecost. I hope this is helpful to you and that it strengthens your faith. And I wish you God's peace this day as we look forward to our celebration of Pentecost on April the 23rd. Peace be with you.